Greetings, everyone, and uh, welcome back, Father Andrew Lauf. Uh, it's a privilege, it's an honor, it's a joy to uh, have you uh, again uh, talking to me, first of all, and, uh, and uh, the audience via this recording. Uh, last time I introduced you uh, uh, very little to the audiences that uh, uh, don't know you, if there are such audiences. Uh, I hope not. Uh, today, I just want to preface uh, our conversation by uh, showing to uh, our viewers uh, a few of the works uh, to which you have contributed. I don't know how uh, well uh, our viewers uh, know Father Andrew's uh, tremendous contributions to uh, great, a great many uh, topics and, and uh, aspects of uh, uh, not only intellectual history, but uh, also the spiritual history of, uh, uh, of the church. And I would like to uh, begin my uh, brief presentation by showing you a, a tiny book that uh, Father Andrew uh, uh, offered me as a gift in 2018 when I visited him in, in Durham. Uh, the Way of a Pilgrim. It's the most recent translation of the uh, famous uh, uh, spiritual novel, uh, Russian spiritual novel about uh, the Jesus prayer. Uh, Father Andrew uh, wrote the introduction and was very much uh, involved in, uh, in producing this book, uh, uh, as, as he says in, in, in the preface of the book. I have here also his card oh, yes. from Hora yes. uh, with uh, Christ is risen in a few languages. Indeed, indeed, ever, always. Mm. Thank you very much. Father. Uh, so Father Andrew is uh, uh, not only uh, a, a great theologian, uh, historian, uh, a professor and so on and so forth. He's very much interested uh, in Orthodox spirituality. The fact that uh, he was involved in this project uh, says a lot about uh, who Father Andrew is. And on the same note, I would like to point out that he contributed to this important volume on the Philokalia, uh, produced by uh, uh, Oxford University Press. And Father Andrew has here a chapter, The Influence of the Philokalia in the Orthodox World. It's a very important uh, chapter. And I uh, would point out the fact that uh, perhaps this should be read together uh, with uh, another chapter on the Philokalia, uh, which Father Andrew contributed to the Festschrift volume dedicated to Metropolitan Kalistos Ware, Abba, the traditional orthodoxy in the West, uh, both uh, very significant for all those who want to understand uh, Philokalic spirituality. But Father Andrew also, that's sampling <laughs> what I found, you know, in, in my uh, tiny library at home. Uh, Father Andrew is also an expert in Christianity, East and West. Uh, look at this volume produced by St. Vladimir's Press. Uh, Greek East and Latin West, the church from AD 681 to 1071. Uh, very important, uh, the last part, of course, uh, refer to uh, uh, Byzantine spirituality, hesychasm, and so on. Uh, and uh, on this note, I turn the page, so to speak, to a slightly different kind of interests of Father Andrews. Uh, this is a tremendous volume, very solid. You can see more than Orthodox thinkers from the Philokalia to the present, which is uh, a tour de force. Uh, Father Andrew visited uh, uh, authors from the 17th century, you know, the Philokalia collection, uh, to uh, the modern Russian pre-Soviet uh, uh, era 
uh, thinkers, philosophers, theologians, uh, moving through the 20th century, uh, talking about uh, uh, the Russian exiles uh, in the West, uh, whatever was left of, uh, uh, of the Orthodox uh, intelligentsia uh, in the uh, former Soviet uh, uh, bloc uh, from Romania with Father Dmitry Steinloyer to uh, Serbia with St. Justin Popovich and so on and so forth, two very modern, very uh, contemporary uh, authors like Metropolitan uh, John of uh, Pergamon, John Zizioulas, um, Christos Yanaras, uh, and many, many others. Uh, of course, there are a few uh, very important feminine profiles here. Uh, Mira Lotborodin, um, Elizabeth uh, uh, Berzigel, uh, Mother Tekla, uh, and so on and so forth. And of course, recent elders like Saint Siluan, uh, Saint Sophroni, uh, and so on. Um, why is this important? Because uh, I hope that uh, during today's conversation we'll be able to uh, squeeze a bit the wisdom of, of Father uh, Andrew uh, in relation to how uh, these modern authors thinkers uh, have uh, approached the topic of interest uh, namely modern science. How do the Orthodox consider modern science? And I'll finish my preface uh, with this tiny book, but very insightful. I haven't uh, read in a while a good introduction to Orthodoxy, highly recommended. Introducing Eastern Orthodox theology. Uh, it's very easy to read, it's almost oral. Uh, you can see a lot of pathos there, uh, the verve of a, of a tremendous speaker who uh, draws on the uh, wellsprings of wisdom in order to um, bring light to uh, sometimes confused contemporary orthodox readership. Uh, what we can call it a catechism. It has all, all you need uh, about orthodoxy and it's uh, quite easy to handle. Uh, it's not a huge tome. It has everything, uh, prayer. So the first chapter, thinking, doing, being and praying, you know, so that, that, that's orthodoxy first of all. Then the doctrine of the Trinity, creation, Christ um, and so on and so forth, human being, uh, sacraments, time and the liturgy it's typical and yet it's very typically uh, typical for father andrew's approach to uh, theology and the christian life what's very interesting about this tiny book introduction introducing eastern orthodox theology is the fact that father andrew discusses here uh, quite upfront courageously but also in a very balanced way matters of uh, well, let's call it science and theology, creation and evolution. And uh, for uh, those of you who uh, would be interested in uh, uh, when, uh, have, uh, with having a taste of, uh, uh, of what he, he has to say, uh, I highly, highly recommend the chapter on sin, death and repentance. This is uh, the framework, it's chapter five in the book. This is uh, the framework where uh, Father Andrew um, chooses to discuss uh, about uh, uh, evolution, although uh, this isn't the only part of, uh, of the book where, where he addresses it, uh, but this is, uh, I believe, uh, the most significant part. I'd like to, to read a couple of passages just briefly, uh, and then uh, I'll invite Father Andrew to uh, take the floor. So, what he says at some point is very interesting. He discusses about how the East and the West uh, have traditionally represented uh, Adam and Eve uh, and the topic of, uh, of the fall. Um, there's a difference, not only terminological, says, uh, says Father Andrew, between the so-called um, original scene uh, the topic um, uh, of uh, St. Augustine in, in the West and the ancestral scene, uh, 
uh, as discussed by um, uh, a plethora of uh, orthodox thinkers. Um, he says that the notion of ancestral sin tends to see the story of Adam and Eve as typical rather than needing it to be strictly historical. Though for the fathers, this distinction was not drawn very sharply. In other words, uh, for the fathers, uh, it's not a matter of choosing between uh, reading Genesis 2 and 3 as a historical account uh, or as a figurative account, uh, a wisdom lesson. Uh, uh, for the fathers, the two aspects, let's call it literal and spiritual, uh, hold together. Uh, that's one aspect of, of great interest, at least to me, because I do believe that um, uh, our conversations today most times are misguided. Uh, most Orthodox believe that uh, uh, it's Orthodox to, to take the literal path. Uh, others uh, choose the figurative path and they don't see that uh, an embodied mentality like that of, uh, of, of the Orthodox traditionally requires for us to, um, uh, well, uh, straddle both areas. And the other passage that I have selected is more uh, directly connected to the topic of evolution. We need to grasp why Darwin and the theory of evolution caused such controversy among Christians from the ninth, uh, 19th century onwards, though it is worth remembering that not all Christians felt challenged in this way. Many of them fell on the idea of evolution as a wonderful explanation of the place of the human in the cosmos. Notable among these were Russian Orthodox philosophers, and uh, perhaps you remember, Father Andrew is an expert. So many of them fell on the idea of evolution as a wonderful explanation of the place of the human in the cosmos. Notable among these were Russian Orthodox philosophers, such as Vladimir Solovyov. Darwin caused controversy, not merely because his ideas contradicted Genesis, but because they fell foul of the way in which Genesis had been read by those influenced by the Enlightenment. For it was the Enlightenment that conceived of the human as almost exclusively rational and intellectual and set the human at a distance from the animal. And I would add from the cosmic, uh, as Father Andrew allowed me to uh, uh, have a glimpse of uh, a short piece that he has recently written uh, on uh, Philip Sherrard. Father Andrew, uh, welcome once again. Thank you very much for uh, being so kind uh, to uh, allocate uh, some of your precious time uh, uh, in order to discuss with me and uh, indirectly uh, uh, the viewers. Um, would you care to comment, uh, uh, please, uh, on uh, the topic of how are we supposed to read Genesis? Uh, we are Orthodox, we're a traditional uh, uh, bunch of uh, uh, Christians. Uh, what does that mean to read Genesis traditionally and also um, with a view to our contemporary concerns? Just before I answer that, can I just sort of add a comment on what you've said so far? The book you started off with, The Way of a Pilgrim, um, um, you, shouldn't, you should also mention the name of the translator who did most of the work. Anna Zaranka, one, one, of, one, of one of my parishioners and a very good friend of mine, um, she did most of the work. Uh, the translation, we, we talked through the translation together, but um, she is a professional translator and um, from Slavic languages, and um, and this is a very the trans the translation is is why that's worth reading. It's a very lively translation. Um, it is actually, uh, and that's that's important because it was in fact and it, it, it in Russia it became very very popular because it 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 evoked a world. It, it's it is it evokes a world in the same kind of way that Tolstoy does, but with um, but in a much more simple. A less complex way, um, but anyway, just say, but but and but um, and and yeah. And the other thing, um, 
just a comment, in, and then I'll come to your comment. In the, the book on um, modern Orthodox thinkers was deliberately called that, not modern Orthodox thought, not modern Orthodox theology, but modern Orthodox thinkers. Because it seems to me that the really crucial thing that we, that, that, one sort of first step, that is about people in different contexts. And I fill in their context, the, the, the difference between somebody like um, Bejaev um, brought up in an aristocratic context. Um, no, he's not that, that's Bulgakov. Bulgakov no. That picture, that picture is a most wonderful picture by one of the, the greatest of the pre-revolutionary, immediately pre-revolutionary painters, Nestorov. And this is um, Florensky, Florensky, and, Florensky and, and Sergei Bulgakov. And, the, and though Bulgakov was the older man, um, in many ways, Florensky was the mentor to Bulgakov. Um, but, and in, in both, in, instead of taking Bejaev, take the, Florensky was born in, 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 um, in what is now, in, born in Georgia, in, in, in what the Russians call Tiflis, but it's now called Tbilisi, um, was educated there. His mother was uh, partly Armenian, and he, 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 he very, had this very strong Eurasian sense of who he was. Um, and this, this feeds into the kind of, to his thought. Bulgakov is very different. He was the son of a priest in the Oriel province. Um, he broke with, um, with his sons of priests were most likely to become, son, become priests themselves, but he, he broke with the, 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 the traditional system of education for priests and went to the um, Moscow University. Um, read economics there, became became an economist, became uh, a professor of econ e e uh, Marxist eco um, um, economics, and then come the twentieth century, he was beginning to find that he couldn't couldn't make sense of a Marxist way of looking at the world, which regarded it as kind of material for humans to consume. This is the, this is the raw materials you use to create the world you want to be in. And he found he he found that he tells in one of his one of his books that he was travelling towards the Caucasus in southern Italy in southern Russia. He could see this the blue of the Caucasus in the distance, and the, the extraordinary feeling he had for the world that he was within. And it came to him that he couldn't really make sense of this in Marxist terms. It, there was nothing nothing magical about the. This, this landscape on Marxist terms, but it was for him an enchanted world and it could only make sense. And he says, he says to himself, I realized I couldn't make sense of this without God. At that time, he couldn't bring himself to believe in God, but he had this sense that he was, he was disconnected from the world in which he was living because of the, the, the very Western education in economics that he'd had, and in particular, the influence of Marx who he continues to respect as a great figure, but as a great figure who got things basically wrong, as well as getting some things very importantly right. Um, and the thing he got right was that the human, the human beings are actually rooted in this world, that they're not sort of intellectual beings that float along. They are actually part of the world, the physical, the material world in which we live. And he felt, and he, he never, never loses that sense. Um, I mean, a lot, a lot of people misunderstand sophiology because they don't understand the understanding of Sophia for him is, is that Sophia is, is God at work in creation. That's what, that's, that, that's what Sophia, so speak, is both God looking towards the world and us looking towards God. And in that, that movement of trying to see across the... Uh, trying to look from the created world to the uncreated world, it is Sophia that, as it was the interface. And because of, and his earliest writing on Sophia are in a work on, on ostensibly on economics, though Rome Williams, quite rightly, in his, 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 his early book on Bulgakov, points out that um, it is very strange work of metaphysics, hardly a work of, of, of economics, hardly a classical work of economics. But in that work, Sophia comes in right at the beginning in, in that the first time he reflects on her and he reflects on Sophia in the context of the way in which humans reshape their environment 
we're the only animals who, who, who make homes in, in the world in which we live. I mean, not just nests or lairs or whatever, but, but create um, a kind of society that, that, that um, creates our sort of, the way we relate to one another. Make, make, make a kind of culture in which to live rather than just being satisfied with where we are. And that is a sign of the Sophianic nature of the human being. And that seems to be a hugely important insight. Um, and, but kind of most people on sophiology get sort of hung up with over what seems to me to be problems, it's, but really quite secondary things. Is Sophia really God or really created or you know, could he be both? And if he's both, doesn't that, as it were, um, displace the place of Christ and all of this. These are actually very, most, all the suggestions that there's heresy there seem to me to be completely mistaken completely mistaken and mistaken because they don't see what the real point is. And the real point yeah. comes out of his sense that the created order is certainly, yes, created out of nothing by God, but that doesn't mean to say that it's worthless. Like Bejaev, it says in another place, that to say that to say an artist that, 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 his, that his work has been made is not um, to despise what he's made, on the contrary, to say that it's made is to is to talk, is to talk about um, its its beauty, its form, and so on. All the good things about it, not all of the good things, but many of the good things about it. It's a, it's it's to, there's a strand in Christianity that 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 says something like this: the world is created out of nothing, and therefore it basically is nothing, and the only thing that's important is God. Let's evade. You see, Escape. and that, this way of looking at things, yeah. it, it can be very dangerous, it seems to me, because, because the world that God created, he created. It must be interesting. Why would he create it otherwise? And, and, and something <laughs> to, to, to find delight in. I remember mm. from uh, St. Athanasius's uh, Life of Antony, uh, that uh, very beautiful delicate episode with with Anthony uh, seeking some refuge on the mountain uh, mm -hmm. and uh, there he finds a, a, a spring uh, and some uh, date trees I think or palm trees or whatever it was paradise and he yes. loved loved that place mm -hmm. loved that place beauty um, uh, serenity he loved that place God uh, God's creation at its best Something mm. similar, but of course uh, 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 more developed say, uh, uh, in narrational terms. Uh, uh, the very interesting conversations between uh, um, uh, Alyosha Karamazov and uh, and Elder uh, Zosimas uh, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, about uh, the beauty of creation and uh, the uh, enjoyment that uh, we uh, are supposed to find. Uh, uh, living uh, in in the bosom of God's creation, uh, th those those are uh, two examples of many available, of course. Uh, that, sure that moment, we're supposed yeah. to to love this this world. Yeah, I mean that marvelous story that that, that is so crucial for, fa for Father Zasima himself, where he talks about his elder brother Makiel, um, who was dying and had a very, very negative view. He lost his faith. He, he was, he felt that he, he, he just felt that he was nothing. And his mother said, will you take communion before you die? And he said, no, no, I'm not interested. Said, no, it's not, it doesn't mean anything. But she keeps on going on about this. And she says, in the end, yes, mother, just for your sake, I will. And remember he receives communion and having received communion, he suddenly realizes he's a Christian. And the whole world is transformed. And he says to his mother, isn't this a wonderful world that we're living in? I mean, isn't everything is wonderful? Every little thing, every big thing, everything is all wonderful. And he's seen this because it's, it is God's creation rather than the sort of- Nothingness. <laughs> yeah, it's not, rather, than, rather than nothing that can. And, and Markiel dies, um, a man of, deep happiness 
and Father Zasim sees this is I think it's it, it's you know it's kind of a, Father Zasim's conversion was the conversion of his brother that that um, it had this impact upon him and it it I mean oh, as you know better than I do I mean, the, the, the novels of Dostoevsky particularly perhaps um, Brothers Karamazov is um, there are these events that happen, um, tiny, sometimes tiny little events, um, and they then reverberate through the whole of the novel. Um, um, sometimes, po mostly positive. There are some negative ones as well, um, but that's that. That that's that actually is the way human. That's what human life is like, I think, as well. That there, there are that it's not so much sort of. Try, it's not nothing to do with seeking mystical experiences that people get very excited about. It's much more suddenly realizing that, that the ordinary actually is created by God and therefore isn't ordinary, it's special. And that goes for human beings as well. They're all in the image of God. Once we see that, we see something different. If we don't see that, then we just see sort of um, intelligent animals. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps uh, it, it, this is the best way of uh, of approaching uh, uh, Genesis. Uh, are are we supposed to learn something uh, something from uh, what uh, we've discussed so far? I mean, you can reduce uh, the mystery of existence to nothingness. That's it. Uh, we are transitory beings here in this prison. We have to do our best to escape as soon as possible uh, to embrace God, full stop. Or there's this other perception of the saints uh, where we can find delight in God's creation. And this is another way of looking at things. Uh, it's not a mystical experience as in uh, seeing the transcendent light, the uh, dazzling resplendence of God's glory and so on and so forth. But it is a way of opening up our eyes towards every tiny bit of creation and see there the signature of God. Is this how we're supposed to look at Genesis too? Uh, not just as a matter of fact uh, narrative, but also... Uh, as something that can inspire us a way of thinking and a way of doing things. See, I think to ask about how the fathers read Genesis. Um, the fathers um, were brought up in, in a, a, a very sophisticated Greek culture, um, which had very, which was dom really, really dominated, certainly I so was dominated by, by what we now call, call Platonism. And it seems to me that, that we will not, the quickest way to realize what's going on when the fathers read Genesis is to realize that they came at it with, looked at it, if you like, almost through the spectacles of Plato's great dialogue on the, on the world, the cosmos, called the Timaeus. And in the time is, there is an elaborate account of, an elaborate account of how the world and the human being are mutually, mutually reflect one another. They are both living beings. They, there's, um, the, into, into, in, and he goes into a great deal of detail about how there are parallels. But, the, the, but this idea though, that the, the, the cosmos and the human sort of mutually interpret one another. That you, we, if you look at the cosmos, we see what's in the depth of our soul. They're both, they, they reflect one another. Right at the very end of the, of the time is, um, he talks about a kind of meditation, sort of looking at the heavens, looking at the stars and allowing ourselves to be attuned to their movement. And that as this happens, we will, realize the way in which the movement of the heavens and the movement of our souls um, should reflect one another so that that tranquility 
that simplicity that you see in the stars should actually be here as well. It often isn't because we are too distracted. We've, we've lost the sense that we really belong to the cosmos and not just to the everyday clutter that's around us. Now, it's this, I think, fundamental perceptions like that that are brought to Genesis. What's happening in Genesis is, is an account of the, an account of the, the transition from chaos to cosmos, from a world which makes no sense, from a world which makes sense. And the final stage in the realization of the cosmos, the world that makes sense, is the creation of man. Man is created on the sixth day, and he's created in a world that already exists and is already ready there to welcome him. And this, this, this ties, ties together the insights of the Timaeus and, and, and Genesis. I mean, I think if you, if you don't realize that, then you will constantly ask yourself, why do the fathers see significance in everything that's created? Why do they see here a picture, for instance, in, 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 when one looks at the animal world, one sees there a picture of moral qualities, good and bad, uh, which human beings can, can, or why do they see, um, um, something that points beyond itself. So the world doesn't draw attention to itself. The world, as Augustine says in, in, in the, early on in, in the Confessions, what the world says, he made us. That's what a creature does. A creature says, he made us, not here self-sufficiently. Um, and this is then elaborated. And the very first, the very first reading of Genesis that we have, um, of an account of, um, is by a second century theologian called Theophilus of Antioch, who wrote is essentially um, a short treatise to some sort of Roman official ex called Autolycus, explaining um, why Christians should be allowed to live their life. Um, the, 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 the way they live is not, doesn't nobody have any harm. It affirms everything that is good about the world and it rejects everything that is evil in the world. That there's no reason why our, our faith should be persecuted in the way that it was in the second century. Um, it's partly a kind of polemic against um, Greek religion, which he's, he sees as full of all the the nastinesses of human nature um, reflected into the divine realm. And he goes on about that at, 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 on, one, on one level, tedious length, at another level, fascinating length, because he quotes from lots of stuff, lots of ancient, ancient Greek writers, who otherwise we know nothing about, but he has long quotations from people we do know about, like Hesiod and Homer, from other people we know much less about. And he also can't get it out of his mind when he's talking about, uh, there's one point, I can't remember it is now, where he begins to talk about the Christian view, of the, 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 to be, interpret Genesis. He has, a he has a quotation from Homer at one point, where Homer is saying something about that, that, that he, he couldn't explain uh, everything that was going on in relation to the Trojan War, even if he had sort of a thousand minds, as it were. And he uses the same the same quotation he uses to talk about what Genesis is talking about, which shows how deeply um, he was embedded in a culture that in some sense he's very ambivalent about. But what he sees in the world, and which is essential, the world that, is, that he sees described in Genesis is a world that in every respect points beyond itself. It is full of symbols, it is full of mystery. He doesn't just see um, everyday things. All these, ev all these everyday things, um, disclose something beyond. And that's, that's, uh, it, and, and so the creation is good because it wouldn't do that if it was bad. And, um, and it also points beyond, in the sense, it also points to Christianity. There are all sorts of symbols in the created order that make sense in the context of the Christian faith. Um, and lo lots of people in the second century do this sort of thing. So for instance, birds sort of flying about, you know, um, in the form of a cross. Yes. Uh, are, are, are a symbol of, of, of are, 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 um, so are a symbol of the place of the cross at the center of the cosmos. Um, 
Then Irenaeus and Tertullian, I think they both refer to... They, yeah, Irenaeus, Tertullian, um, Justin Martyr, they all have this. There's one piece in the Timaeus where um, he's describing how the world is put together. And the world is put together, basic, uh, the, the fundamental bit is, is, the, is the kind of soul stuff, which is then clad with material stuff. And the soul stuff is, is, is kind of, it's, it's almost as if it's been by, by it, it's almost as if it's a recipe. You, you, you have two bits, so you get two bits together, uh, and then you put them crosswise and then join them at the top. Um, I'm doing this. Can I just take this? I think it may be important. No problem. Unless I get there. Good, right, let's get on. Um, and this sense of the world as as full of full of signs that point beyond themselves. I mean, Dionysus here, I forget, at one point in a letter written supposedly to, to, to John, the theologian, John the Apostle, he says, truly visible things are symbols of invisible things. And that's the kind, that fundamental perception is the, is, 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 is the way in which Genesis is read. So it's not, it's, it, so you've asked what, what is the, the history's there, it's, told, it's a story told about something taking place in six days. But the fathers, first of all, point out that, that, that They can't be ordinary days because the ordinary day is based on, they thought, is, 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 is based on the, the revolution of the sun around the earth. And so the first, the, they aren't created until the fourth day. So the first three days must be some other sort of a day and then extend that. I mean, the day must be, the day is in some sense, some sort of, some sort of movement from, Darkness, light to darkness to light. It's very interesting that, that, that it's always there was evening and there was morning, day one. There was evening, morning, second day. It's also interesting that the first day is not called the first day, it's called day one, Imeremia. And um, the, they, ref, they reflect on this because the f number one is a different kind of number from the rest of the numbers. It's the source of number, not proper number. So all of this sort of speculation um, that belongs to the Greek tradition is, is, is there as early as, in some sense, as early as Theophilus, but the, the greatest Greek um, um, commentary on the six days, as they call it, the Exaimer on the six days of creation, is by Basil. And Basil is, is, has got really quite a considerable knowledge of, of um, early mathematical theory. Um, and so the Genesis is, not, the fathers don't read Genesis um, as if the history was all that mattered. In fact, what really matters is not whatever sequence took place. What matters is what it means. And what it means is that God, God created a, a, a world in which he, he was able to, dis to disclose his glory. Um, one of the last commentaries on the Exaimeron in the Western tradition is book seven, I think it is, of um, Paradise Lost, oh. where Raphael, the archangel, trying to persuade Adam not to go and be, go and be silly and, 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 and disobey God by eating the apple, gives him an account of the six days of creation, says, this is what God has created. Are you going to go and destroy it? Is effectively what it got. That, that was translated into German and became the text for um, Haydn's creation. And it ends in Milton, as it does in, 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 um, in Haydn's creation, with the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens are telling the glory of God, that great chorus at the end of the, of, of the, of the, of the creation story is in fact um, the way in which Milton saw the Exeumeron ending. That's what it's all about, that a great, the created order is created to, dis, to display the, um, the glory of God in, it, in all its manifold richness. Um, it's, it's something that it's, it points to something which is to God himself, the one God, but it points from a kind of base which covers everything, 
Um, there's a very there's a wonderful phrase in um, Ephesians, I think it is, which talks about the polypecular philosophia, the, the 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 many varied wisdom of God. The polypecular philosophia, which covers everything, everything's got a place there, and all of this, as it were, is drawn into a unity which is found in God. And and so. Um, in this light, the, the entire creation is full of signs, full of, of symbols, uh, which actually uh, make impossible uh, an exhaustive understanding, analysis and understanding of the world, per se, uh, without uh, its uh, ultimate term of reference, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Who is the creator whose glory is present in uh, well every uh, tiny bit of creation mm, that's right um and and to go back to what we were saying earlier on about about Vulgarkov and sophia it is actually sophia that is that, that is that is that you, you are discerning when you are discerning the the manifold glory of the cosmos it's, it's, it's something that, that Sophia, as it, as it says in, in the Book of Wisdom, moves through everything um, with, with a kind of subtlety and, um, um, so I can't remember the quotation now, but, but it moves through everything with a kind of subtlety that holds everything together. Um, this this and, makes the, the universe an icon, isn't it? it, it, it yes. It's supposed to be taken as an icon, literally, not figuratively. Um, mm because it, it, it always sends our mind elsewhere. I mean, you can look at the beauty of the creation, you can find enjoyment like uh, St. Anthony with, with his uh, uh, palm dates um, uh, or date palms or whatever they are called uh, and uh, some uh, veggies there and, and, and some um, uh, uh, spring of water. You can find enjoyment, but, but then that beauty uh, of the creation sends you to its origin, its source, the source yeah. of life. Yeah. And, and this is by definition um, uh, how uh, an icon functions. You yeah. look at the object, uh, you see there a person uh, and the image uh, sends you elsewhere, puts you in touch with, with a reality that, that transcends the object itself. Uh, how can, how can that help us, for instance, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, striking a balance, if that's possible at all, uh, between a scientific worldview uh, and a faith-based Christian worldview? Well, I think... Science is developed by taking the created order very seriously. It's very interested in, in, in created things. And it's very interested in, 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 in tracing links between created things. Um, um, and one of the, the most influential ways of understanding not the cosmos as a whole, but just one very important part of the cosmos, the, 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 the the plant and animal world, the bits of the cosmos that is in a way we are we are part of. I mean, we we have a lot a lot in common, and things like DNA have shown the extent to which there is there is a kind of common pattern which which runs th runs through the whole of the the as it were sentient and animate order of which we to which which we belong, and. Um, as you said in that quotation from my book earlier on, that one of the one of the revolutions of of Darwin was to remind people of something that is very very well known in the fathers, that we are part of the animate and sentient order, that that, that, that they, these parallels are real, um, because because we are that's where we belong, we belong somewhere else as well. I mean, one of the th ways of putting it that. Um, you find particularly strongly in Gregory Nyssa, is that we are, we are frontier men. We are, we are, we are a methorion, or um, the, 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 we, we are the frontier between the, 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 the not, not just between 
the created order, it blanket. We are we are on, on the boundary between the sentient and animate order of animals and plants, everything, and another world uh, which reaches out towards God uh, through the intellect, through the noose. Um, intellect has been, which well, all our language has been damaged by the. To put all my cards on the table, all our language has been damaged by the Enlightenment and by the exaltation of man's rational faculty, understood in a very narrow way. And see, when we talk about when we talk about science, I think we have to say, think. I think we have to bear in mind two things. One is that it is um, it has discovered all sorts of wonderful things about the world. We know the world um, in a better way. Um, in more detail, with more accuracy um, than science prior to the Enlightenment. But we do this by simplifying. We are looking at what we can measure. We are looking at what is quantitative, essentially. Um, the qualitative can be important, but the qualitative, they, there's, always a, there's always this kind of yearning to, uh, not a yen rather, to, to to make the quantitative qualitative. Um, I, for instance, take color, which is essentially qualitative. If you can explain it in terms of wa wavelengths, and clearly you can, in some ways, explain something in terms of wavelengths, then you've reduced it to a quantitative measure. Um, but I still want to say that, that, that we are missing something if we identify color with wavelength. Um, there, it, there's more to it than that, um, and you don't have to know about wavelengths to, to appreciate the beauty of flowers and colour and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, you don't need to know about wavelengths to understand, even to, even to appreciate great art. That, there, there, there is an immediacy of our experience of colour, uh, which, is, which is important. But science, in fact, um, because it's based on what can be, what can be measured and repeated, um, does two things, measured, therefore quantitative, repeated, therefore taking the observer out of the equation. The idea is that anybody could be looking at this, even though, of course, in lots of very fundamental ways it's not true. I mean, look through a telescope without having, uh, having some, without having been told well, how to use it and how to look through it. I, you don't see anything. I, I was not any longer wonderfully powerful telescope on a Greek island looking at the stars. I couldn't see anything. Um, I, could, I couldn't interpret what it was that I was seeing in the way that the, the, the astronomer there could. But, but nevertheless, the idea of the science is that in principle anybody could look at it. And so the, the observer doesn't contribute anything to what it is that we're seeing. It's a purely objective understanding of the world. And this world is, 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 is essentially quantitative. Now, it just seems to me that that, that, that is very successful in all sorts of ways, but it's missing a great deal. And the danger is that we're going to say, what we can understand is what is really there, and what we can't understand, well, we forget about that. And that is, I think, really quite dangerous, um, that, that, that we, um, We end up making, making the world an alien world where we don't belong. We don't see it like that. We don't feel it like that. Um, it, it can produce, it, I think it can produce a sort of, yeah, I don't know how to, how to put it. Like with uh, 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 Bulgakov and, and the mountains. Uh, yeah. It won't help to make sense of the beauty of that scenery. Uh, you, you have to be there and uh, look at the, the mountains and then realize that uh, uh, economical, I don't know, rationale or uh, um, mm -hmm. equations in physics and stuff like that won't help you uh, or won't, won't uh, uh, boost your experience uh, of, of that uh, wide horizon uh, and that sense of belonging that you, you have when you when you look at, uh, uh, at the mountains in, in that field. Yeah, that sense of belonging is so important, I think, that, 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 to feel, to realize that we live in a world um, where we belong, rather than living in a world that's alien to us. 
I mean, the world, the world, since the 20th century has, this, a lot of literature in the 20th century is exploring what it is like to live in a world where we don't belong. And that, that sense that we live in a world that we don't belong is, is, is because of the way in which a kind of relentless scientization of everything does produce a world where we obviously do not belong. Um, we can't imagine it. Um, we don't feel at home in it. We can't even perceive it. I mean, there's that wonderful example, uh, which is meant to be proving something else, at the beginning of Eddington's book, The Nature of the Physical World, where he starts off by saying, now I'm sitting here, in the world very familiar, world very solid, world we've got a desk and things like that. Uh, I perceive them, I can measure them, um, I know what they are, I know how they've been made. And, uh, it's a world which seems, which I belong to. But he says, no, it's not like that at all. What we know as scientists is that most things are basically nothing. Um, that, that, that they are made of atoms, and atoms are basically nothing with a neutron and a few neutron protons in the middle and electrons going round. But, and, the the solidity is an appearance. It's to do it's it's to do, it's to do with um, the way in which um, um, the way in which atoms form themselves into molecules. And molecules um, are, are distinct from other molecules. That sort of thing. And and he and he 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 he, he says he goes. This is a, a strange world, but this is the way the world really is. Well, there seems to be one fairly obvious objection to this um, is that. If we create a world, if we think the world is a world that we cannot perceive, then what's it, what is our knowledge of this based on? It is based on what we perceive. The theories about the atomic structure of, of the world are based on observations of things that, that we can perceive. It's based on sort of a reality that we're familiar with. And to say that it that this can be also understood in terms of another way, which is the thinking in terms is of, of, of electrons and, and stuff, is is not to say that the world that we perceive doesn't exist, which Eddington wants to say that this world is an illusion. The reality is the theory. I think that that is that step is a step of self-alienation from the world, which is going, which is, has, can have terrible spiritual consequences. I mean, Eddington was a contemporary of Kafka, and Kafka is somebody who finds himself living in a world where he's completely, he's not at home. And what it is that makes him not at home is not physical theories, but theories about, th theories about administration and structure, um, which are all sort of, all, all um, to do with um, theories as to the way things work, theories as to the way human beings work, theories, and these theories create a world which we don't belong to, we don't understand. Why am I, why am I being asked to do this? Why am I being sent to this place? Why, you know, all the sort of stuff that Kafka asks, all these questions in the, um, in, in the castle and in the trial. But this poor little chap, um, every step he takes makes the world even more foreign than it is. And isn't that, isn't that a terrible judgment on the way in which we are trying to exclude the human from the world in which we live and re reduce everything to theory and pattern? I mean, really good sociologists can go beyond this. I mean, there's a wonderful book by Mary Douglas, um, quite late, um, done, put together by, with, with a friend, a um, younger friend. and. How institutions think, it's called. <laughs> it's a very scary world, but it gets less scary if you understand <laughs> understand you know, why, um, is it I mean. Um, but then Mary Douglas is a very, very, very remarkable sociologist um, who kind of saw beyond sociology to the, the, the way in which, you, well, in her early books, the way in which we 
a lot of sociology each simply ignores um, the symbolic and wants everything to be down to in terms of, of, of something to be checked, which is the way our world is going. I mean, schools, school teachers spend more time filling in forms so that which are meant to be checking something they're meant to be doing, but they haven't got time to do any longer. And that's that that is creating a, a terrible world. Um, I'm listening. Yeah. Um, where do we go from here? That's just one. That's just one. We've actually just explored one little sort of cul-de-sac. We could come back to the main thing and carry on. Yeah. Um, uh, it's uh, look. It's fascinating, and, and I believe that uh, uh, this is uh, something that uh, should. Uh, uh, give us all an idea of how significant it is to uh, learn how to look at, uh, at things, reality, the world uh, with uh, different lenses, with uh, different mm -hmm. eyes. I mean, for a positivist culture like ours, it's all about what you said, you know, uh, this prosaic dimension of, uh, of reality, mm -hmm. what I can touch now, that's, that's reality, but I lose perspective of everything else. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, the, uh, well, the, 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 I think that the most familiar, unfortunately, for all of us, um, example is that of uh, the relationship between uh, economics and, uh, and life, you know, mm -hmm. where everything uh, is reduced by, by economists uh, to uh, numbers. Uh, yeah. and, uh, that, that makes us aliens, as you said. Uh, yes. And, and Mind you, when you say well, the example you gave, I, I would come back to you over there. It seems to me that, that what, the, what the Enlightenment does is that it reduces the world to what we can see and measure. It doesn't need touch so much. Touch, in fact, is one of the senses that, that, that is not regarded as important. Um, it's happened in medicine as well. That, that if you look, look back, say, to 17th century with the work, say, of Sir Thomas Brown, the great, the great doctor of the, of the, of the um, 17th century. And he, he, when he talks about what he does, holding somebody's hand, touching them, feeling them, he's finding something qualitative. He's not just finding whether they're hot or cold or whatever. It, there's more to it than that. He finds it very difficult to explain what this more is, and we don't not interest any longer. We 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 really see human beings as collections of symptoms, which we then measure and then try and work out how to sort of modify them. But it's not a person that we're talking with often the time. And patients say this; they feel they're not there. They they are just sort of um, a kind of bundle of symptoms. And that's that. that there are lots of lots of. Lots of examples, but one of the things it seems to me that there's this the we will get a long way, I think, in beginning to understand how things are if we paid attention to the other senses that we've got, other than other than under, other than un, other than making understanding um, on the analogy of how we see. We can't see things too close up. It's always over there. It's objective. Um, what we see, um, and and the um, well, in fact, objectivity is is connected with an understanding of knowledge that's based on sight. When you think what the world would look like if you just all you're doing is feeling it, you have a very strong sense of being there, but it'd be quite difficult to to work out what work out. There's no strong sense of objectivity. You know, the story about three blind men sort of uh, approaching an elephant and some think it's a snake some think it's a it's it's it's, it's a something it's a tree and some think it's you know um, something else because what they what they what they're feeling is indeed there um but but feeling by its own um gives you a sense of being there without giving you a sense of the wholeness of the uh, yeah, the, the, yes, something like that. But in some in some respects, what's more important is the feeling that you're there rather than 
understanding all its sort of dimensions. And um, I, mean, I think in Gregor Nyssa, there in the commentary on the, on the Song of Songs, he doesn't just use sight. In fact, he says fairly early on, sight's going to fail because we enter into the darkness. We cannot see anything in the Gnophos where God is. And so we have to forget about that kind of knowledge. What are we left with? We're left with touch, a sense, a feeling of his presence. Um, Aesthesis tis, um, tis parousias, I think it is the expression. Smell, taste, these are things, very important. Uh, the way it's we read the piece songs. of, uh, of uh, St. John's first letter. Uh, yeah. What we oh, yes. What we saw, what we heard, what, what we touched. I don't know if it... Uh, it what it, we handled it, of the word of life. Yes. So it, 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 it's a knowledge that is experiential. Uh, yeah. It's not by models. <laughs> but I think these... I mean, there are thinkers who are thinking about these things. Um, um, Mons Bachelard, um, who, who has this fascination for, for the traditional elements, which aren't really elements in our sense, because we know that everything is not made out of... Um, but our experience of the world um, is made out of something you know water and fire cold and heat these these are these are fundamentals of our experience of the world so the, there's a lot of truth behind the understanding of the of the ancients that there are four elements out of whichever to me um then they're not elements in the in the sense they thought they were because they are made out of other things and yes you trace all the way back to electrons and atoms and stuff but nonetheless, our experience of the world is actually made out of these elements um, and, the, and the symbolic qualities that they contain, which is important, um, that seems to me. And, um, and the Genesis account, though of course it doesn't talk about the elements because it wasn't part of the Hebrew tradition. Um, it's interpreted by Basil in terms of the elements. Um, and the way in which the elements sort of relate to one another, um, um, he sees a kind of cycle whereby close to fire there is air, which is which is still hot, but is 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 still is hot and wet rather than hot and dry, isn't it? And he, he has this out out of taking two oppositions between hot and cold, and dry and wet. You can see a sort of cycle, and the importance of the cycle of it, of course, the whole of everything is connected with everything. Father Andrew, uh, if uh, uh, Saint Basil, uh, his brother uh, Saint Gregory of Nyssa, and many others before and after them were able to um, uh, refer to the available sciences in order to uh, let's call it fill the gaps. Uh, in uh, in the Genesis narrative of creation, uh, to give it uh, some sort of uh, intelligibility for the the audiences of that time. So, if they could do that, um, could we do something similar today in order to make the same message of creation intelligible to uh, our contemporaries? Um, can we bring in, for instance? Um, uh, aspects such as, uh, I don't know, uh, cosmic evolution, although I know you don't want to apply the word evolution to everything <laughs> in heaven and on earth. Uh, can, can, uh, can we bring elements of cosmology, for instance, in order to uh, fill the same gaps in the narrative uh, or biological evolution and so on and so forth? In other words, to cut it short, uh, can we bring science in uh, in the conversation or in, 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 uh, in our attempt at making sense of Genesis uh, for our contemporaries whose minds are educated in this scientific culture of today? I think there are, um, but I think it's, it's, it's less direct than it was for the fathers. Um, partly because it becomes so specialized. 
Uh, one of the one of the effects of the advance of science from the seventeenth century onwards is that it's become uh, um, really very specialised. Um, there's there's nobody who begins to understand the whole scientific world because you can only understand a bit of it and then assume by analogy that the rest of it's much the same. And then you'll find people saying, well, it isn't much the same because it's very, it's the, the, the whole, the, a biologist looks at the world very differently from a mathematician. Um, and um, the kind of things that, the kind of, um, you know, But it seems to me that 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 there are cons there there are concepts that have got lost because of this specialization. So we, we all, it's different. Everybody knows everything about everyone knows everything about something, but nobody and um, nobody really knows much about everything in the same way. And that this, this I think this this sense of this produces in a sense again a sense of alienation from the world that we know bits bits here and there but the whole thing um, is much more difficult to grasp and it's the it's the sense of the whole that we're missing and it's i think this sense of the whole the sense of a, a lack of the sense of the whole is what lies behind lots of you know new agey movements i mean they're thinking that well that they it does all hang together in some sort of way and there must be ways of accessing this. Um, and um, I don't think we have, we need to find an understanding that incorporates what science has, 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 has discovered into a, into a broader picture um, that, that, that helps things to hang together. I mean, I was once, um, I'm giving an example of something, I tried to do something along these lines. I was asked to, go to a conference on a Greek island, so I was very keen to go, um, 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 on climate change, what we had to say about climate change. And I was asked, could I go and say something about what perspectives the fathers might have on this? And um, so I started off by saying that, that, that I think probably most of us will think that the fathers had nothing to do because climates weren't changing very much in late antiquity. That is actually a great mistake. Um, there was very dramatic changes of, of climate in late antiquity, um, particularly in the sixth century. Um, we don't know what it was that caused it, but the skies became much darker than they were. Um, the temperature dropped dramatically. It had a very, very severe effect on agriculture. Um, there was a great deal more famine at the end of the sixth century. And also the sixth century was, was a period of, of plague like as it had not been known before. Um, some sort of bubonic plague. Justinian nearly died of the plague. Um, and so they knew dramatic change, but they didn't have, but their ways of interpreting it were not, were on the whole, I would want to say simplistic, as if you know, this is God punishing the world for its, its wickedness. Um, maybe, but it, 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 there's a lot of linking that needs to be done. But nevertheless, they do have concepts that we might find very useful. And one concept, which is very, very basic to the understanding of the cosmos in late antiquity, both by Christians and by pagans, was that it, it was a kind of single whole. In fact, the, the, the Christians had a word for it, which doesn't exist in pagan Greek, to refer to the cosmos as tasimpanda. The everything that's all together, the sim, the together, tapanda, everything, tasimpanda, the, the everything that is all related. Um, and they, they had a notion of, they, they had very strong ideas that there were links between one thing and another. That the whole thing was, um, there was a kind of cosmic sympathy that ran through the uh, simpanda. Now that's an idea that, that, that is, keeps on coming up in discussions about climate change. That climate change, you can't just talk about climate change in Australia, even though it's a long way away, we don't know where it is and that sort of thing. It, because what goes on in Australia affects everywhere else and everywhere else affects what's going on in Australia. And one of the things that, 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 that people are thinking about quite a lot, interested in climate, is the way in which um, everything is related to everything. 
um, um, I think the the melting of the of the polar caps is going to have a dra very dramatic effect. But that dramatic effect is not simple. It's not just that the the seas will rise and there'll be less land. It's not just um, that um, that the the the, the sort of contrast between the, the different zones of the world are going to become less. It's also that, for instance, I mean, to take a very parochial English view of it, England has and has had, as far as we know, for about 2000 years at least, a very equable climate given how far north it is. And this is because of the Gulf Stream. And the Gulf Stream is because of the, it, 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 it is affected, is, it, it could even vanish as a result of the of the of, of the uh, melting of the um, of the ice of the northern ice ice cap, if it vanished, our temp our our our, um, our climate would become much more like Nova Scotia. Very very cold winters and not it's not very warm summers, um, because everything is related in some kind of a way. And there's the, there are, um, the butterfly effect, as it's sometimes called. That is also another example, which seems incomprehensible, but makes a bit of sense um, um, if you try to understand it in terms of modern mathematics, chaos theory. Um, and so when we, we begin to develop, we're beginning to develop ways of understanding the world that make sense of things that seem very surprising. But what they make sense of is a world that really is some sort of profound unity with a kind of profound sense of sympathy that runs through it. Now, the father's got quite a lot about the, 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 the... That's so significant. Uh, unfortunately, in many uh, uh, Christian narratives today, uh, precisely this idea of a continuum uh, where all things hold together has disappeared. Uh, yeah. Especially uh, uh, the various uh, forms of uh, creationism uh, mm. boil down to the the affirmation that there is this continuity mm. ontologically and otherwise uh, because God intervenes supernaturally which by yes. the yes. is something that has to do with nature uh, and disturbs uh, 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 the continuum of, uh, of nature and so uh, all these discontinuities uh, create actually an alien world where nothing holds together with anything. Uh, no, and, and I believe that the way you're describing it also sort of gives you a hint as to where it's all coming from. Um, the notion of the supernatural is not an idea that, that, that occurs anything like as dominantly in Greek thought as it becomes, to, as it does in. In, in Western thought after Augustine. I mean, Augustine, in, in, Augustine was dealing with a problem as a real problem, but in wanting to, wanting to make clear, a clear distinction between the realm of nature and the realm of grace, which he wanted to do in order to oppose um, Pelagius, but wanting to make that clear distinction, um, he creates, he creates a, a fissure in the world of nature, as it were. There's nature which is just pure nature, and there's another nature which is, in some sense, all right. And um, and it seems to me that um, nobody believed in creationism in the way the creationists believe in it until after Darwin. It's a reaction to Darwin. Um, it's not. It's it's not. They think of it. I think. As they are, they are saying what everybody believed, but nobody actually thought of it in these terms until wanting to um, um, have a response to something which they felt was damaging. But why, why, why would uh, the topic of uh, 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 this ontological solidarity between all things created? Why would this uh, uh, put in jeopardy uh, our faith? For instance, in, in your book, I was happy to discover in a couple of places um, your uh, firm, clear position that the idea of an ontological continuum of the creation is very important. It, it's a patristic topic 
it, it's a scriptural, it's a liturgical topic, uh, and there's no uh, reason for us, Orthodox at least, to no, there are... pass the idea of this continuum. But you see, one of the things, one, one of the, if we begin to talk in terms of evolution and change, um, we all automatically assume that everything is getting better. It's kind of Whig theory of history applied to the cosmos. But it's not likely to be like that. Human change, we know, involves not just remembering, but forgetting. That, that in fact, the, the, the only way in which societies are able to cope with the, the unfortunate bits of their past is just to forget about them. Um, and indeed, we can't, we, we can't remember everything. If we remember, if we if we could remember everything, we could we could never actually begin to experience anything at all. And there's that wonderful story by Borges, Funes the Memorius, who is afflicted by being unable to forget any of everything. So, if he wants to remember what happened yesterday, he has to relive through. He has to relive yesterday through yesterday's time, which means he'll never experience today. So. Forgetting is, is, is an important part. If, if, if there's any change, it's going to be new things and old things being forgotten. You can't have... Now, the, what do we forget? Well, we actually forget quite a lot. Um, the West has forgotten more than the East. The East is very tenacious um, of what it thinks is important. The sense of the sense of the whole. Um, and I go, I, I, it's, we've been talking for a long time, and I've been summoned elsewhere. So I think we'd better leave this here. But I think that, that this, the, this question of a kind of naive attitude to what evolution might mean, and seeing it as essentially a positive thing, um, is something that, that, that we need to th think through a bit more carefully, really. Um, and Philip Sherrard, the person you've mentioned, I think he has real insights on this. That's why I mean, I think he's. Then th he, this begs uh, 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 another conversation. <laughs> yes, but I'm not sure when. I'm, I'm, I'm say way next week and in Greece after that. It'll have to be in September, I think. Thank you very much, Father Andrew. I'll uh, stop the recording now. Uh, I, I'm so grateful for uh, your insights uh, and. Uh, uh, on behalf of, uh, of our viewers, I, I wholeheartedly thank you and, and wish you a, a great, happy, safe holiday. Yes, thank you. Thank you.